Hello and no, welcome to the brand new edition of Policy Watch. I'm Kriti Mishra. In a fresh round of FDI reforms, the government has allowed 100% foreign investment in coal mining and contract manufacturing, eased sourcing norms for single brand retailers and approved 26% overseas investment in digital media. The changes seek to liberalize and simplify the FDI policy to provide ease of doing business in the country, leading to larger FDI inflows and thereby contributing to the growth of investment, income and Unemployment. The reforms have attracted a record FDI inflows in the last five years. Total FDI into India from 2014 to 2018 has been $286 billion as compared to $189 billion in the previous five year period. And to get deeper insights on the topic, I'm joined by Dr. Subhash Chandra Pandey, former Special Secretary, DIPP, Dr. Arvind Virmani, Chairman, EGRO Foundation, and Mr. A.K. Bhattacharya, Editorial Director, Business Standard. Welcome to Ratsabha Television, all of you. Dr. Pandey, let me come to you first. Take us through the important changes in the FDR regime recently. Okay. Kriti, there, there are three important background developments that are driving these changes. One is that maybe more than a decade now, we are having a savings rate is falling in the economy. So, to meet the savings investment gap, we have to be dependent on foreign savings more and more. And uh, therefore, uh, the uh, inviting foreign capital is a necessity to boost investment. Uh, that is number one. Second is that given the current uh, dynamics of international trade and business environment, there, there are reported moves of a relocation of manufacturing facilities by leading international brands. And therefore, we have to create a conducive environment that some of these investments can come to India. For that, as a prelude, recently the, we have uh, announced uh, reduced corporate tax rates for new manufacturing units. So, when we uh, connect all these three pieces of jigsaw puzzle, we see why we need to liberalize not just uh, a single brand retail, its uh, contract manufacturing, its suppliers, whole supply chain and uh, uh, sourcing of items, whether for a uh, domestic consumption in India or for export because without export many of these manufacturing would not be having the scale to make it competitive enough. Absolutely to yeah. make yeah. India yeah. more competitive Com in the international re arena. Yeah. But Dr. Virmani talking about the specifics, the single brand retail. Now these mm -hmm. retailers were advocating for a more liberalized FDI climate in the country, in India specifically and the stringent sourcing norms were considered as a major stumbling block. Now that these norms have been eased, how would it balance the interests of the retail giants, the global giants and also the local producers? See, one of the things which is kind of forgotten uh, quite generally is that when we say FDI policy, it's a question of how the policy on investment discriminates against a foreigner. You know, there can be a general policy for investment which is applicable to both domestic manufacturers and foreign manufacturers. That is something which is, you know, which is our own prerogative. Uh, what people often confuse is, they confuse the two, uh, especially. So, uh, when we say single brand retail or multiple brand, I think as far as the policy is concerned, I think this thing, distinction should be done away with for everybody. There is, however, a second issue which comes up, which is the sourcing part itself. Yes. Whether it's a domestic seller or a foreign seller, the question is, should we have some uh, policy on, uh, on domestic sourcing per se? So, uh, you know, if we uh, think and separate these out a little bit, uh, then uh, the, the issue would go away from just being us versus them type of thing, which usually comes up in FDI uh, as against uh, something which should be encouraged. Now, what is the experience of uh, the, the Southeast Asian countries was that generally if you facilitate, encourage uh, them to buy domestically, uh, if it is competitive they generally turn. In the beginning they are actually always hesitant. So, then one can focus the policy on the sourcing and make sure that they are aware of all the uh, uh, opportunities. For example, labor intensive manufacturing if not for uh, labor policy should be uh, is now uh, very profitable uh, should be in India. So, then you start focusing on the key uh, issues of why uh, 
uh, this thing is not happening something which we want to happen uh, all of us do. So, uh, uh, looked at from the, that perspective as I said it is better not to focus on the restriction there restrictions we should say we will give up in the uh, you know the single multi brand and all should go in the next so many years and then focus on making sure uh, that the what goes into them what is sold there is uh, produced as much in India as, uh, as possible. I will take that to Mr. Bhattacharya. Yeah. <coughs> Sir, would you agree with Dr. Vermani that these distinctions should be done away with and also in terms of local sourcing, we should be more liberal? Well, I entirely agree with Dr. Vermani on this. I mean, there cannot be uh, any view which can be any different from what he has said because after all, you know, an FDI policy itself is a reflection of some sort of certain aberration that you are having an investment policy uh, which, which discriminates uh, the flow of capital into for creating jobs and, and, and creating capacity. But having said that, uh, let me uh, highlight uh, what this FDI policy uh, announcement that you had referred to at the yes. start of your program actually tries to, to uh, attack. Uh, at one level, it tries uh, to tackle an infrastructure deficit in the economy. Today, uh, in spite of abundant coal available in the country, we are increasingly importing more coal. Now, I think the policy says that now 100% coal mining will be allowed. Yes. Now, yes, there are many challenges in, 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 in attracting uh, private capital or the foreign capital into setting up coal mining in this country. But I think it is an important signal that the government has tried to give to the coal mining sector that foreign capital is, is welcome if they can augment the existing coal production facilities. Right now, we are importing coal, which is actually a kind of a national shame in my view, because you are unnecessarily importing coal, whereas you have your own coal. Now, that is one uh, thing it, this policy does. The second uh, segment of the policy looks at easing of the existing policies, which is allowing the contract manufacturers to come to the automatic route. Right, right now, it, it, every contract manufacturer comes and it has to go through the FIPB, it goes through and if it is more than 300 crore, it goes to the cabinet. Similarly, the, the sourcing criteria that you know, 30 percent of uh, your entire sales in, in single brand retail will have to be uh, domestically sourced. Now, that has been relaxed. Now, this definitely means that the retail giants can come in. And the third element of the policy change has been to, in my view, a plug loophole, which is in my sector, in the media sector, yes. which is that the, the government had allowed FDI in print with a cap of 26 percent, FDI in news print. But uh, for some strange reasons, the FDI policy on digital media, which is growing faster than the print these days, was was made unclear as a result of which uh, FDI investment flows were coming in without uh, any uh, policy uh, you know space. So, I think government has plugged this 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 loophole in the policy by saying that the digital news media will also have come under the same cap of 26 percent. Now, you might argue that the cap should be there or not 26 percent should go on 49 percent or not that is a different matter. But bringing a parity between print and digital news, I think uh, given the current policy environment is uh, was a loophole and it has been done that it is a good thing. So, this in my view is a broad perspective of these policy changes that have happened and on the whole I would I would agree with Dr. Virmani on uh, Dr. Virmani you want yeah, I, I would yes, add sir. on all these three things. Yeah, I, I do not think there is any disagreement it is just a, a relative emphasis. So, so, uh, but the contract manufacturing I think is tremendously yeah. important yeah. Uh, and I would link that to the uh, corporate tax changes, you know. So, there there seems to be emerging, you know, I have been writing about this for uh, or tweeting about it for the last year, but I think the government is finally thinking systematically of how to attract supply chains. So, uh, I, I, I must admit though we have, I have and many of us have been talking about corporate tax uh, chain. I was surprised that this element, extra element of reducing it immediately uh, to, to uh, what was it 15 percent yes. for new contract uh, for manufacturing companies was a very, very pleasant surprise for me. And uh, so, taken that, that's 
taken with the, what was mentioned by both of them on the contract manufacturing again you know the uh, policy already allows 100 percent manufacturing but the people who wanted to come in were there were some confusions you know so from that perspective it no, is it an ex automatic yeah it and, and it's become automatic yeah automatic so automatic once it automatic. goes in the, the confusion compounds yeah, you absolutely. see that people say absolutely. oh this that and the other yeah. so it was very very important you know because in our system uh, <coughs> which people are scared of, of the foreigners that is something special to foreigners they are terrified of the bureaucracy <laughs> in india mm -hmm. so to just clarify it and make it automatic is itself a big thing but what I wanted to put it was perspective that the government is now thinking somewhat systematically of how to attract that supply chain and therefore I think that is much more important than it might have been say five years ago or something. Uh, the second one very briefly on, on the mining I think the, the issue on uh, mining again I 100% agree with what uh, Mr. Bhattacharya said but I would add that you know th there is a, a still a problem of the policy on mining you know. Uh, the ultimate goal which we thought when the liberalization started is to make specialized mining groups come in and supply to everybody but right now it's still fragmented you know there are certain types of mines which are only supplying for electricity somebody has to supply x amount to so on so that basic policy again this distinction between FDI specifically and that basic policy that basic policy also needs to be changed to get full advantage of this because you know we, we do not have a single one of the big mining companies in the world operating in India and part of the reason is the general policy Absolutely. on mining. Absolutely. Yeah. So, we will just discuss the sectors threadbare yeah. but talking about coal mining specifically. Dr. Pandey, how will these changes make our market more competitive and efficient and reduce our imports? Uh, you see the, the um, as Dr. Virmani was explaining the FDI policy even the now the changes is all subject to whatever is there in terms of a coal mines a special provisions act 2015 or mine minerals regulation development act. So, uh, uh, unless the sectoral basic framework is further changed. So, th there is a series of interconnected changes that are uh, I would like to uh, draw attention to another way, way of looking at these changes is a uh, uh, welcome change is that so far in our thinking on FDI we were more concerned about the ownership pattern and right. which could be uh, gamed by uh, uh, saying equity or uh, surrogate equity in different forms uh, convertible debentures. Uh, now, we are gradually moving from ownership more to the effective control. And therefore, we are saying it is not the uh, exactly the shareholding, but the down the line effective control through even contractual relationship on actual production, manufacturing and use of that output is what matters. And if that ultimate output is being produced in India with Indian labor, Indian material and a reasonable sourcing of Indian uh, goods uh, 30 percent or three, then it is a uh, it is a welcome change. So, from ownership to control and focusing on making those manufacturing competitive by adding the like the liberalizing the sourcing by uh, including the export turnover without export turnover many of these uh, uh, like a smartphone manufacturing will not be competitive in India. Absolutely. So, we are mm. talking about competitive mm. manufacturing in India and of course, make an India initiative has been uh, mm. the priority for the government for quite some time. Dr. Virmani, you were talking about contract manufacturing. Mm -hmm. Now, it has been liberalized at the yeah. FDI in that particular sector. But do you see that this would lead to mushrooming of local producers specifically in the electronics and the pharmaceutical sectors? Yeah. So, uh, uh, j just to clarify, uh, the, 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 you know, may some companies set up a buying office. So, that is where the confusion arose because a buying office, they said, is not a manufacturing yes. thing and so you will, you cannot do it or whatever. So, th there was a real reason I am not saying it was spurious there was a real issue there anyway. So, so uh, uh, how will it uh, help uh, uh, clearly uh, the opportunity is there and uh, you know people uh, th there is also a little bit of uh, uh, focus you know I was recently looking at the ease of doing business indicators and I compared India and Vietnam you know Vietnam has received uh, uh, according to news and data which is floating around. Uh, kind of three to four times the shift of FDI from uh, China and other places in, in the last year. And I was looking at the uh, indicators, India's every indicator like 9 out of 10 indicators are better than Vietnam's. 
so so the puzzle was how, why is that if every uh, international indicator that i could find 90% of those were better for india why is this puzzle so i actually asked a, a vietnamese economist and what they said is that they focus on uh, large companies which have connected supply chains and make it facilitate their entry you know unfortunately historically which i hopefully is changing our bureaucratic thinking is the opposite if you get a big company you see how you can milk it for getting taxes and, and so on they do the opposite they say let's get these fellows here other companies will be attracted they will say oh these guys are doing fine why should we not be here and then their whole supply chain because a big company you know, like samsung or and so on or a big japanese company has a whole string of suppliers so th that attracts all of these so so that's another aspect which is connected which has to go together a as uh, former secretary said there's a whole uh, connected stuff but of course each uh, part is important like the one we are discussing absolutely but talking about our own space our own sector mr bhattacharya you said that this is a welcome move for our sector 25% of our indian 26% 25% of Indian youth are yeah. hooked on to the digital medium. That's right. And 26% now under FDI route for the digital medium streaming news. But many experts are still calling it restrictive. Well, you know, it is restrictive if you look at the entire FDI cap concept. Any cap, concept of a, a cap uh, is uh, nothing else but restrictive. Uh, but whether uh, you want to put the cap at 26% or at 40% or 60% is something uh, that uh, the the government of the day will decide. Now there was a time when FDI in the entire media was completely barred. Now uh, in in year 2000, uh, 2001, if I remember correctly, this was relaxed, uh, but, but the Vajpayee government relaxed it, and for the first time FDI was allowed in this country. Even now FDI in media has come with a lot of restrictions. Now uh, you might argue uh, in a in a completely free enterprise economy that uh, um, uh, there should be no restriction on FDI in the media also. But I think that we can have a separate debate. But given the fact that the government of the day has decided that there should be a cap, the disparity between the FDI in print and FDI in digital media probably was uh, uncalled for, unnecessary. And it is a good thing that that disparity has been removed. And we have uh, a situation where both the print and the electronic media, digital media has got the same cap. Remember that uh, many of your print newspapers already have a digital yes. space. They are, so they are interconnected and many of the digital uh, companies may go into print. Uh, so, so there is a possibility that the policy arbitrage is possible if you have different uh, caps. Absolutely. So, for policy convenience, I think it is a good move. Whether it should go up to 26 to 40 percent is a matter of further debate. But let me come uh, on the larger point on the FDI policy uh, and Dr. Virmani referred to Vietnam. My sense is that FDI policy liberalization in itself is not good enough. Uh, you need to follow it up with uh, other policy changes like it happened in the case of the income ta corporation tax cut. You know, you had the contract manufacturing and immediately new manufacturing companies were getting 15 percent basic tax and plus another uh, cess and surcharge taking it to 17 percent. Now that to my mind is where the policy can work. But if you have a, a, a ranking of uh, 173 out of 190 countries in enforcing contracts, which means your commercial court system is completely broke, then naturally even if you liberalize your FDI, the foreign investor will think that even if I come in, into this country, how do I enforce my contracts to get electricity if India's rank has fallen. So therefore, FDI policy cannot work in isolation. It has to work along with concomitant policy changes and uh, you know as they say it's many of the, the factor market reforms. So I think uh, it's a good move but it, the good move will, will, will result in, 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 in changes in economic growth, development, jobs provided we take the follow-up measures as well. Absolutely. Dr. Virmani, FDI policy cannot work in isolation. 
how do we remove these bottlenecks so uh, i the the good news is that it, it, the, the public was getting this impression that in the first term of uh, this government uh, the the bjp modi government uh, the focus had shifted uh, more to uh, social uh, programs etc etc uh, fortunately uh, uh, since june or so uh, th there is now a new feeling which i uh, heard from many people and of course i agree with that is that the focus is shifting back to economic policy reform which are constraining economic growth job growth they go together if the policy is right it's the same thing like fdi policy liberalization and other policy liberalization whether it's mining or something go together if they are both in the right direction if they are in opposite direction they cancel each other out so same way uh, uh, i think the job and gdp will go together if the appropriate policies are made now you know some people are of the impression that you have to do everything at once it is that is not how uh, investment works you know if you give a clear credible signal of a move towards whether it's labor policy by doing a uh, few number of things which are critical and then saying okay over the next 5 years we'll do or whether it's land or whatever policy the important thing is to set down the direction so the good news is that now there is a hope uh, different people have different probabilities uh, or d uh, different extent to which they think it'll happen but i think now there is a hope that some of these other constraints including the ones which mr bhattacharya has mentioned will gradually get corrected and i hope it's right because that's how we'll get the uh, high gdp growth and the high job growth you're making a very important point that clear signals have to be given i'll yeah. take that to dr credible Pandey. credible credible and <laughs> clear signals have to be yeah. given dr pandey globally fdi inflows slid by 13% hmm. in 2018 india remained a preferred destination but how do we further exploit our potential to attract fdi uh, i fully agree with uh, my co panelists that fdi policy per se is not the uh, end to achieve what we in, uh, intend to achieve it has to be supplemented with sectoral reform and across the board also in improving the ease and cost of doing business. I would like to point out to the cost of doing business, especially because this Vietnam example was there. The cost of doing business is high because of the uh, burden of uh, uh, taxation and cross subsidies and tariffs. So, for example, railway freight, uh, sub cross subsidizing railway uh, passenger fares or uh, power industrial power tariff cross subsidizing household and agriculture so because of these uh, thing the ultimate burden on the industry in terms of a cost is uh, is rather high and efforts are slowly being made to rationalize that so as they uh, from 142 to 63 uh, uh, it's a remarkable achievement in eodb ranking but 63 is also compared to the size and complexity of india's economy even 63 is a yes. uh, big man. So, we, we have to move faster in that direction in both ease and cost of doing And ensure ease of doing business. Mm. Mr. Bhattacharya, I'll give you the last word. Mm. Red carpet for global investors. The opportunities for India amid US and China trade war. Well, I think, uh, you know, uh, you have to look at uh, uh, India's, uh, the market uh, as a big opportunity in my view. Um, uh, I personally feel uh, that if you can make uh, the FDI policy more attractive, if you can make uh, improve uh, the ease of doing business in this country uh, b b even better, uh, there is no reason why uh, the huge uh, number of companies are moving out of China. Uh, most of them are going to Vietnam and Cambodia and Bangladesh. There is no reason why India should not uh, be uh, a preferred destination, particularly at a time when you have uh, your corporation tax rates have been tackled. I think uh, some of the, the signals are right. And uh, if uh, the other areas of concern, which is I think that the legal reform area is a big uh, area where uh, not much has happened so far, particularly in the, the commercial disputes area. You have an insolvency where we have made tremendous gains. Mm -hmm. We have made gains in terms of tax administration. Uh, so, that is the point I was making that we need to make accompanying policy changes, which we, some of which we have made, uh, more needs to be made and then I think the sky is the limit.
Dr. Vermani, you wanted to make a last point. Very quickly, one point which to end on a positive note. You know, we we are still behind other smaller countries like Thailand and Malaysia in many of these indicators. But one other one thing which nobody uh, except China, I mean, after China, nobody else can match us, is in the size of the market and in the human resources available. Despite all the weaknesses in education and skills which can be corrected, the size of that resource is no other country can match. Absolutely. So on that positive note, thank you so much for joining us. So FDI is a major driver of economic growth and a source of non-debt finance for the economic development of the country. And with these reforms, the government has tried to put in place an investor-friendly policy on FDI. That's all we have for you in this edition of Policy Watch. Thanks for watching and stay tuned to Rajya Sabha Television.